Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. This is Dave Lewis, and today we are going to continue our series studying the doctrine of the Trinity. So, those of you who are regular listeners, you're getting a peek into the insanity that is my brain, because I've been bouncing all over the place talking about free will compatibilism and the bondage of the will, and I'm talking about uh, dogmatic theology versus biblicism, and then I'm talking about uh, you know having interviews with people about free will, and then you know I had I started this doctrine of the Trinity series a month ago, and I just bounce around from thing to thing. That's kind of my life as well. So uh, welcome to my crazy world. Um, please like, share, subscribe, leave a review if you're listening to the podcast audio. Uh, whatever you do. Uh, if if you are a regular listener, if you're a first-time listener, welcome, and check out our content. Now, this is going to be a potpourri episode, kind of. Let's see how it unfolds. I have a loose plan of what I'm going to do. So first, we want to finish, because we ended part one. If you want to go back and listen to that, we use this book, Introduction to Dogmatic Theology on the Basis of the 39 Articles, E.A. Lytton. He's an Anglican from the 1800s. And we want to conclude, because... Uh, we talked about the biblical data that the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, said and did things that only the God of the Old Testament said and did. He made claims, he made statements, he did things that only the God of the Old Testament was able to do. And the Pharisees knew this, and that's why they called him a blasphemer and crucified him for it. And we, we went pretty thoroughly through that. So go back through part one if you want to see the biblical presentation of Jesus Christ being divine uh, in the in one being of God he shares it and it's clear now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit briefly because what about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit a person of the Trinity or is the Holy Spirit just some force some impersonal force or is it actually a person let's see but before his departure from the world so we're reading from Lytton now the Savior promises disciples that he would pray the Father to send them another comforter or advocate to take his place, John fourteen sixteen, and again that he himself would send the comforter, John sixteen seven, whom he calls the Spirit of Truth and the Holy Ghost. We learn that shortly after his ascension, this promise was fulfilled, and thenceforward the Holy Ghost appears so prominently as the divine administrator of the church that the gospel dispensation is fitly described as the ministration of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3.8. The Holy Ghost is spoken of in terms which apply, imply a divine nature. He is said to, quote, search the deep things of God, which reason tells us no created being can do, 1 Corinthians 2.10.11. Spiritual blessings are invoked from him conjointly with the Father and the Son, 2 Corinthians 13.14. To him, and also to God, spiritual operations such as the new birth, John 3, 5, the dispensing of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, the inspiring of prophets, 1 Peter 1, 11, are ascribed. Unless we should suppose that nothing more is meant than an emanation or influence from God, he is invested equally with the Father and the Son with a personal character. The Holy Ghost teaches... John 14:26 appoints ministers Acts 13:2 sends an apostle on a mission Acts 10:19 bestows gifts as he wills 1 Corinthians 12:11 can be grieved Ephesians 4:30 makes intercession for the saints Romans 8:26 and he must be distinguished from the Father and the Son in the same way and to the same extent as they are distinguished from each other he who is sent by the Father and the Son cannot be either of them as such if he receives of Christ, John sixteen fourteen, he cannot so far be Christ. If he is descended upon if he descended upon the Saviour at his baptism, while well, a voice from heaven proclaimed, This is my beloved Son, therefore the Father's voice, he could not be the voice. Finally, in appointing the initiatory rite of the Christian Church, our Lord formally associates the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost as the sacred name into which converts are to be baptized, Matthew twenty eight nineteen. 
So there's your scriptural testimony for the deity, personality of the Holy Ghost, of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the one God, Yahweh, monotheism, Jewish monotheism, clearly and forcefully taught and stated in the Old Covenant scriptures, of which Jesus is the fulfillment. And then Jesus of Nazareth comes on the scene. He says and does things that only the God of the Old Testament can say and do, such as forgive sins, receive prayer, receive worship, etc., etc. And this is all in part one, so if you, if you want to go back and look at that. And then we have the Holy Spirit, who is sent by the Son, and who has a personality, and who is to be distinguished from the Father and the Son, yet he is one with the Father and the Son. So there's much more to be said about that, but if you go back and listen to part one, and then you look up those scriptures that were in part two, uh, which is right now, as we speak, <laughs> part two, um, then you will see that there is the biblical testimony of this, and there's much more biblical testimony of this. And we will go back through, I, I plan on making some of these series very, very in-depth, and we'll go back and look at scripture verses, but I'm trying to get a more of an overview, a broad overview here. Because uh, I want to do this, and then I want to talk about the person of Christ and his two natures, um, and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and you know me, I like to, to learn from others who are smarter and more sophisticated and well, better educated than I am. So, in this session, we're going to listen to Dr. Lane Tipton. Now, I got permission from Reformed Forum and Camden Busey to, in an email, to actually show this. Uh, because it's it's not behind a paywall, but it's it's behind. You have to register, and it's a class that they just released on the theology of Van Til, the theology and apologetics of Van Til. And that you know he's going to talk about Van Til, but it's kind of beside the point. This is a great illustration of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, if you go back to part one, Lytton made the distinction between two ways to talk about the Trinity: the biblical historical way, how it is revealed progressively in the Old Testament. Uh, one God, monotheism, and then in the New Testament, uh, it is revealed historically, redemptively, and we look at the scriptures, and that's what we've done. And then there's, for lack of a better term, the philosophical um, way to contemplate and think of the triune God. And that's what Dr. Tipton is going to teach us. So I thought, uh, instead of, um, you know, just trying to do this myself, we'll let him teach us, and then I'll stop and start to make comments. But he's about to give us the classical biblical teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity, one being shared by three persons who are eternally distinct. And then my plan is to start looking at the Nicene Creed and start talking about the Arian heresy. And we're going to start getting more deeply into that. Um, so, you know, this is a basic historical theology overview uh, with the biblical theology mixed in. And I hope this is helpful for you. So let's listen to Dr. Tipton and we'll go from here. Let's think about that and talk about the relationships that obtain within the ontological trinity and why they're important. Now, Van Til is talking here about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who as such are one God. Van Til's confession, like any Reformed Trinitarian theologian, is that there is one living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about the relations that Van Til brings into view and give you a little bit of background and expand on this quotation from page 13 in, the, in Common Grace in the Gospel. First, and by way of preface, there are first and foremost relations of origin among the persons of the Trinity. So this is important. So if you're listening, he's just drawn a triangle on the board. And the top says Father, bottom left of the triangle says Son, bottom right says Holy Spirit. And within the triangle, he wrote one God. And I, I reproduce it on my whiteboard here too, so I can interact with it a little bit. And then he wrote living on the one side of the Father and true on the other side. So, the, first of all, he's going to talk about the relation of origin. Now, remember, we are attempting to speak 
of a reality that we cannot comprehend. It is the one true living God. He is totally other than us. So we are trying to comprehend a mystery that has come to us through revelation. So remember that. So for example, we're talking about relationships of origin in a being that has no origin because he has no time. He has no beginning. He is eternal. So right away, it's like, well, wait a minute, relationships of origin, but he's eternal. Well, Dr. Tippin is going to explain that, but let's see what these relationships of origin are. Discriminating, incommunicable, personal properties. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Those are relations of origin. The Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. But we have to ask this question based on Van Til's language. What is the relation of each person to the nature of God? I'm going to represent that by lines that move from each person to one God. Okay, so this part's important. And my, my, uh, my, my little, um, what are these called? Uh, the, the um, I forget what's called the little rubber thing. It's not working very well. It's not working very well. It's kind of annoying to me. But this is important. So we have the father's unbegotten. That's his personal property incommunicable between the other persons. The father's unbegotten. The son is begotten of the father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son. So the procession begottenness and unbegottenness. Those are the incommunicable personal properties within the persons of the Trinity. But now what Dr. Tippin is going to do is he's going to, he's going to put these arrows pointing to this one God. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, how do they participate in the being of the one God? That's what he's going to talk about now. And let me put it simply and then in ascending order of sophistication. Each person in the Godhead subsists distinctly and entirely as the undivided essence of God. So let's put it this way. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Each person is the undivided and simple essence of God. Or to put it in more traditional Trinitarian language, each hypostasis is a subsistence within the Godhead. And so these lines that move from the person of the Father to the unity of the Godhead, the person of the Son to the unity of the Godhead, the person of the Holy Spirit to the unity of Godhead, these lines represent relations of subsistence relations of subsistence. So we can say this, the Father is the entire Godhead in a distinct relation of personal subsistence. The Son is the whole Godhead in a distinct relation of personal subsistence. And the Holy Spirit is the whole Godhead in a distinct relation of personal subsistence. So. Each person subsists as the entire and undivided Godhead. And that is something that brings into view what? These relations of subsistence brings into view the unity and absolute co-equality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is something Van Til depends on quite distinctly from Augustine and Calvin and Hermann Bavink relations of subsistence. So there is one living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit of God. These are relations of subsistence represented by these lines that move from the persons to the unity of the Godhead, one essence. And, and Van Til says that each person then 
relates to the nature or essence of God in this way. Secondly, each person not only subsists as the entire essence of God in relation to the other persons, but each person indwells the other person in a relation of co-inherence, so that the Father exhaustively indwells the Son, and the Father and the Son exhaustively indwell the Spirit. in these relations of what we will call co-inherence, or perichoresis. Now, this re requires a bit of explanation. So, are you with me so far? If you don't understand this, it's fine. It's, it takes a while. Now, I want to address an objection. Well, none of this is in the Bible. Well, see, here's the thing. If, 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 that, if you have that objection, you, you have fallen into Biblicism. You have fallen into... Um, it's actually a form of rationalism. So you have fallen into the trap that you and you alone in this generation are studying the Bible afresh, and you don't think there needs to be theological reflection upon the data of the Bible. That is what Dr. Tipton is teaching. The church history going back to the early fathers, culminating in the Council of Nicaea and post-Nicaea and moving forward, the Trinitarian consensus came as the fathers wrestled and taught the biblical text. And then, of course, what made these type of clarifications and wrestlings and doctrinal developments and statements necessary? Heresy. Heresy. So the absolute unity of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and then the absolute co-equality of the Father and the Son, for example, was necessary. Why? Because Arius, a false teacher, came along and said the Son is not co-inherent with the Father. The Son does not share one subsistence with the Father. The Son is of a different subsistence. He is of a different being. He is of the creation, which is what Arius taught, that the Son was not to be seen as co-eternal with the creator he is a created being so let's hear what dr Tipton continues so i just wanted to point that out Th these things i mean the scripture drives us to these conclusions and it's it's just frustrating i don't know what it is about our culture i don't know what, what it is about how philosophies and different things have infiltrated us but we act like it's bad to reflect on the interpretations, interactions that men in the past had with Scripture. That has no authority. That has no bearing on anything. It's not even worth studying to some people. But when we do it in this generation, we are correct and we are being faithful to the Bible. But you're doing the same thing as those men did in the past. I mean, what are you doing? Are you just sitting there with an open Bible reading passages and not interpreting them? I mean, that's the only person that I would respect to be consistent as a biblicist. All you should do is quote the Bible with no commentary, no comment, no reflection, no interaction, no comparing Scripture with Scripture. Didn't do any of that. Just read your Bible out loud, okay? And, of course, nobody does that because nobody's consistent with what they claim they're doing. Well, I'm just going to the Bible. No, these things are reflections that have been passed down as part of the treasured tradition of the church. Now, do they trump the Bible? No, we're not Roman Catholics. But they are to be respected and drawn upon as theological resources for our interpretation of the Bible. Now, if we discover that the Bible contradicts these things, then we go with the Bible. But the Holy Spirit has been active since the day of Pentecost in the church and leading us into all truth, not only in producing the Holy Scriptures, but also in guiding men that have gone before us, who, by the way, those men viewed the Scripture as their sole infallible authority. Contra Roman Catholicism and their claims that, no, the early church taught that there was a second a stream of authority called tradition. Okay, I, I've, I, let me, let's go back to Tipton. When the Father begets the Son, 
the Father dwells in the person of the Son, and the person of the Son dwells in the Father without there being any confusion of the two distinct persons. The Father as the Father indwells the Son, the Son as the Son indwells the Father in what Van Til calls an exhaustively personal relation. Relations of subsistence speak of how each person relates to the undivided essence of God. Relations of coherence explain how person relates to person within the Godhead. And the point that Van Til wants us to understand is that there is no residue of impersonality as person indwells the person, but nor is there a loss of the discriminating and incommunicable personal properties that distinguish the persons. And so whether we're thinking of how persons relate to persons in relations of coherence, where each person indwells the other, or whether we're thinking of each person subsisting as the entire and undivided essence of God, intrinsic to that is Van Til's distinctive claim about the persons of the Trinity. Each Trinitarian person, A, distinctly subsists as the entire Godhead, and B, exhaustively dwells in the other, in a mutual relation of personal bliss in which person indwells person. And the key is that these are living persons. These are not inert, inanimate, static persons. These are eternally living, dynamic, and immutable persons who are God and who indwell one another Van Til calls this a relationship of complete interdependence. That the Father and the Son and the Spirit relate to one another in these relations of subsistence, coherence, and origin. And Van Til infers from this that the persons are equally ultimate. And there's the promo for it. So go to reformforum.org. I'll put this link in the show notes. And um, you register, and they have they have several courses that you pay. And it's not even that much. It's like $40 for a whole course. Uh, but this one's free for now. Uh, and I, I highly recommend it, recommend it. And it's actually cool, too. There's quizzes. Um, they break it down into sections, and there's quizzes. And you take quizzes, and you get graded on the quizzes and stuff. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So... Um, you know, I know that's complicated, um, but, you know, the the basic thing you need to just get the basic down is you have the triangle, if you're watching, and then what you have is you have the one being of God, and then you have the three persons of God. And the one being of God is shared by these three persons. Um, the the co, uh, what did he call it? Uh, what, did, what did Tipton, what language did he use? Subsistence. So they, they, this, they share this subsistence of the one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. So there's not three gods. It's one God. They, the three persons share that one being. Yet the triangle, the lines that go between the persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, those have to do with coherence and indwelling. And then, the, of course, you have the language of the Father is unbegotten, the Son is begotten, and the Holy Spirit proceeds. So you have these distinct properties so there's, so there's a clear oneness of being, but threeness of persons. And the persons are distinct with their own qualities, yet they share in the one being of God. And um, when we get to the person of Christ and how his divine and human nature is, I'll have some analogies that will help us sort this out. But of course, remember, this is the mystery of the Holy Trinity. It cannot be, by definition, God cannot be compared to anything in his creation because he is other than the creation. So all analogies you'll hear about the Trinity um, are not accurate. They might help you understand an aspect of it, but they'll ultimately fall short 
because you can't compare the uncreated, eternal, holy God with something from nature. So now let's see what the time is. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to bring up and we're going to officially start studying the Nicene Creed. So this is the second um, creed. This is the Nicene Constantinople uh, Creed. But we're going to take a look at this. So this is the creed that was developed in response to the Arian heresy. So here we have in three columns, if you're listening, the Greek text of the Nicene Creed, the English text, and the Latin text. Uh, so here's, let's read it in English. Uh, because many, many Protestants don't even know the Nicene Creed. They may have heard of it. They certainly don't study it. They certainly don't have it memorized. And they certainly don't recite it at church, which, I mean, I don't understand that. I, mean, I went to an Anglican church. I went to Anglican churches for years and we recited this every Sunday and I found great value in it and I still do. Uh, when I was studying Greek in seminary, I have my, um, I don't even know where that Bible is and that bothers me, but I have a, a reader's, a reader's edition, Greek New Testament, and I have the Greek text of the Nicene Creed, uh, I glued it onto the inside flap of the that Bible, and I would, as they were reciting it in English, I would go over it in Greek. So it was pretty cool, and I would read it in Greek, and I would, and I, I figured out how to read the whole thing. But anyway, so let's let's listen to the Nicene Creed in English. So this was the document that was produced. And this is a very important point. This document was meant to cause the heretics to not be able to sign it and thereby proclaim themselves to be non-Orthodox and to be departing from Orthodox Trinitarianism. So why is that an important point? Because many times the Nicene Creed is seen as the great ecumenical document that's going to bring all Christians together. Now, I would agree that the Nicene Creed is a good starting point between Christians of different traditions. To say, well, can we at least agree on this statement? However, let's not forget that the nature of the document called the Nicene Creed was to exclude heretics. So, so the document itself, as it was produced, had the purpose of division. Had the purpose of showing truth from error. And the Arian party could not sign it and we're gonna we'll read something about that in a moment so but let's just read this i'm gonna read this into our hearing uh because there may be some of you that caught this podcast and this video that have never actually studied the nicene creed or even heard the nicene creed we believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the only begotten son of god begotten from the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one substance, homoousion, or substantiae in the Latin, with the Father, through whom all things came into existence, or through whom all things were made, who because of us men and because of our salvation came down from the heavens, and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man and was cru crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead of whose kingdom will, there will be no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead 
and the life of the world to come. Amen. So some of this, if you compare the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, for example, many of that second part is in thumbnail form, the Holy Spirit, uh, or the Virgin Mary, Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, buried, rose again, will come to judge the living and the dead, then the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the dead, and life of the world to come. So what we want to look at here is the part at the beginning and how it identifies Jesus Christ. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about how God is described as the Father Pentocratora, Pentocratora, all strength, all might, the Almighty. Very important. God is the Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. But then we have the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the language they use of the Lord Jesus Christ is specifically designed to counteract the doctrine of the Arians. And the doctrine of the Arians is that Jesus Christ is not of the same substance or being with the Father. He is of a separate substance. He is not of the subsistence or the substance or the being of the God the Father. He is of the created order. He is of that order. Because look, there's two orders. There is what is created, and there's the creator. I mean, and, and just the basic, this is like the most basic bedrock foundation of the Christian worldview. There's only two categories of things. The creator and his creation. Everything falls under one of those two categories. And in the Nicene Creed, the language is, he is begotten from the Father before all ages. Ton ectu patras genethneta pra panton ton ionion. He is begotten of the Father before all ages. So in other words, there's this eternal begottenness of the Son. And Dr. Tipton was talking about that. There's this quality of the Son of origin that is eternal, yet it distinguishes him from the Father. So the Father is unbegotten from none. The Son is begotten from the Father, yet this is an eternal begottenness, not a temporal. Once again, the mystery of the Trinity. Don't try to wrap your mind around it. It is a mysterious thing how the Father and the Son can have an eternally begotten relationship so that the Father has never been without the Son. So here's the thing. The Father and the Son have been in this eternal relationship of fatherness and sonness. The two persons, the Father and the Son, have always eternally been in this relationship. Jesus Christ did not become the Son of God. At his baptism, which some teach, or even when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin. The Son of God has been the Son from all eternity. Jesus, the Son, the eternal Son of God, pre-existed his birth in Bethlehem because he's the creator of the universe and all things were made through him. Now look at this language that the fathers at Nicaea used. They said he's phos ek photos, light from light. Theon Alethanon ek theu alethanu, true God from true God. So notice that he it's taken an attribute of God the Father and saying Jesus Christ has that same attribute. Jesus is light from light, true God from true God. Okay, and then the word they choose to use to describe. Jesus Christ is that he is Ganesthenta, 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 U Poethenta. He is begotten, not made. So the Arians wanted to put Jesus in the category of he is made, not begotten. No, 
The father said he is begotten, not made. And then, here's the word. Homoousion. It's right. It's, I can't write on this. Homoousion topatri. Of one substance, or substantiae qua paterest, one substance with the Father, of one being with the Father, homoousion. Now, this is the word, a non biblical word, by the way. This is the word that the fathers found that drove the Arians nuts. Let me read you a. Um, a cool part from this book. So this is um, Schaff's uh, Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers second series. This is volume 14, the seven ecumenical councils. Volume 14, the seven ecumenical councils. Oops, I dropped my thing. So this is on page, what page is this? I don't even know what page this is. Page three. So this is right up front. This is right up front. So, um, let's read this historical introduction, and then I want to read this excursus on the word homoousios. The history of the Council of Nicaea has been so often written by so many brilliant historians from the time of sitting down to today that any historical notice of the causes leading to its assembling or account of its proceedings seems quite unnecessary. The editor, however, ventures to call the attention of the readers the fact that in this, as in every other of the seven ecumenical councils, the question the fathers considers was not what they supposed Holy Scripture might mean, nor what they, from a priori arguments, thought would be consistent with the mind of God, but something entirely different to wit, what they had received. They understood their position to be that of witnesses, not that of exegetes. They recognize but one duty resting upon them in this respect, to hand down to other faithful men that good thing the church had received according to the command of God. The first requirement was not learning, but honesty. The question they were called upon to answer was not, what do I think probable or even certain from Holy Scripture? But, what have I been taught, what has been entrusted to me to hand down to others? When the time came in the fourth council to examine the tome of Pope St. Leo, the question was not whether it could be proved to the satisfaction of the assembled fathers from Holy Scripture, but whether it was the traditional faith of the Church. It was not the doctrine of Leo in the 5th century, but the doctrine of Peter in the 1st, and of the Church since then, that they desired to believe and to teach. And so when they had studied the tome, they cried out, This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. Peter has thus spoken by Leo. The apostles thus taught. Cyril thus taught, etc. No acts of either the first two ecumenical councils have been handed down. So, what's what's the point he's making there? The point he's making there is, these are not men who are just assembling and coming and, and just out of nowhere, just in that historical moment, opening their Bible and fighting about the exegesis of the scriptures. Now, is there scriptural defense? Is there scriptural uh, arguments? Yes. But what they are doing is they are saying, we, this is what is taught and has been taught. This is the theological reflection upon the scriptures that has been handed down to us and that we are preserving. But that's a very important point. So this is where sola scriptura is a little more sophisticated of an understanding than solo scriptura or biblicism which would have these fathers sitting around a table with their bibles open not talking about the history of the church not talking about what was passed down not talking about the traditions that they had learned from their teachers who learned from their teachers who learned from their teachers who learned from their teachers, from their teachers. no it wouldn't be that it would just be them sitting down having a Bible study together, and coming up with this stuff. No, their reflection on Scripture generated this dogmatic formula. So dogmatics is the inscripturated revelation being wrestled with and placed in historical language 
And that's what the Nicene Creed represents. Now, listen to this. Because this is important too, to understand the mind of the fathers. So it says here, the fathers of the council at Nicaea were at one time ready to accede to the request of some of the bishops to use only scriptural expressions in their definitions. Okay, pause. So there were some among the bishops at the Council of Nicaea. And by the way, just so you know, Council of Nicaea, what's the date? 325 AD. What was the historical situation that brought about the ability to even have the Council of Nicaea? It was the Emperor Constantine and his conversion to Christianity and him making Christianity the official religion of the empire. So the Christian church went from a persecuted minority without state sanction to the religious majority with state sanction. Now there's, there's much debate on how much of the Roman Empire was actually uh, nominally Christian at the time Constantine converted, but some measures say up to 50% or even more. But now the Roman imperial government and its money and its power is behind the church. So now there are bishops able to gather. And there is one bishop who its tradition says he attended the Nicene Council without his arms or legs or his eyeballs. All wounds from persecution. Yet he was in attendance at the Council of Nicaea. That's just absolutely un unbelievable. Okay, so, so back to this. So they were willing to only use... So they... Like, so in this formulation, let's use nothing but scriptural terms. Let's not depart from words and phrases that are actually in the Holy Scriptures, that are actually in the biblical text. So they were willing to do that. Why didn't they? Well, let's, this is very instructive. But after several attempts, they found that all these were capable of being explained away. Athanasius describes with much wit and penetration how he saw them nodding and winking to each other when the Orthodox proposed expressions which had thought of a way of escaping the force of. So they would, they would propose, well, let, let's, let's talk about Jesus this way. And Athanasius said he looked across and saw the Arians winking and nodding at each other saying yeah yeah we could we could we could confess that yeah we could we could we, yeah we, we're okay with that we're comfortable with that because see this is the problem they're they're willing to accept certain language as long as they control the definition so yeah use whatever language you want but i'll control the definition the Arians said we could still but from what they were saying, the Arians were thinking, we can still confess Jesus as creature, not creator. We can still confess Jesus. And even, you know, the Arians were even willing to give Jesus the honorary title of God, the honorary title of deity. But they were not willing to place him in the category of sharing the being of God the Father. They weren't willing to do that. So what did the Orthodox do? After a series of attempts... In this sort, after a series of attempts of this sort, it was found that something clearer and more unequivocal must be adopted if real unity of faith was to be attained. And accordingly, the word homoousios was adopted. Just what the council intended this expression to mean was set forth by Athanasius as follows. Okay, so here's a quote from Athanasius. So Athanasius, very important church father in these matters. I mean, wrote a whole tract called The Incarnation of the Son of God. And Athanasius was deposed from his bishopric multiple times and was in exile for his defense of the Nicene formula of who Jesus was. Politically speaking, the Arians almost rose to total ascendancy and domination in the church after the Nicene Council. And Athanasius was one of the sole voices still fighting for Nicene orthodoxy, that Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of homoousios with the Father. So let's, let's hear what, what Athanasius says. That the Son is not only like to the Father, but that 
as his image, he is the same as the Father, that he is of the Father, and that the resemblance of the Son to the Father in his immutability are different from ours. For in us they are something acquired and arise from our fulfilling the divine commands. Moreover, they wish to indicate by this that his generation is different from the, that of human nature, that the Son is not only like to the Father, but inseparable from the substance of the Father, and that he and the Father are one in the same as the Son himself said, the Logos is always in the Father and the Father always in the Logos, as the Son and its splendor are inseparable. Okay, so that's end quote from Athanasius. The word homoousios had not had, although frequently used before the Council of Nicaea, a very happy history. It was probably rejected by the Council of Antioch and was suspected of being open to Sabellian meaning. It was accepted by the heretic Paul of Samosota, and this rendered it very offensive to many of the Asiatic churches. On the other hand, the word is used four times by St. Irenaeus, and Pamphilius the Martyr is quoted as asserting that Origen used the very word in the Nicene sense. Tertullian also uses the expression of one substance in two places, and it would seem that more than half a century before the meeting of the Council of Nicaea, it was common among the Orthodox. Vasquez treats the matter at some length in his disputations and points out how well the distinction is drawn up by Epaphanius between Synosius and Homoousias. So Synousias and Homoousias. For Synousias signifies such a unity of substance as allows of no distinction, whereas the, wherefore the Sabellians would admit this word. But on the contrary, Homoousias signifies the same nature and substance, but with a distinction between persons one from another. Rightly, therefore, has the church adopted this word as the one best calculated to confute the Arian heresy. Okay. So, point. This word, this non-biblical word, homoousios, which was in use, and there's evidence that the church fathers used it before the Council of Nicaea. The fathers at Nicaea viewed this word, and when, they, when, they, when the word was used, the Arians could not accept it. They could not confess that Jesus was homoousios with the Father, of one being, of one substance with the Father. Their teaching was he is of a different substance with the Father. Now, the Arians, like many heretics, they would say they are defending the honor of God. What are they claiming to defend? They are claiming to defend monotheism. So many heresies up front claim to be defending the honor and the goodness and the character and the nature of God. But in reality, that's a smokescreen for denying essential biblical doctrine where Jesus actually is of one being with the Father. He does share the being of the Father. And go back to part one where we talk about Jesus saying and doing things that only the Father can say and do, of the God of the Old Testament can say and do. Another important point to make on this. We can, of course, defend the doctrine of the Trinity from the Scripture alone. And we don't need to resort to the Nicene Creed. But what does the Nicene Creed represent? The Nicene Creed represents our forebears, which, by the way, are still living in the communion of saints, the great cloud of witnesses. So many times, uh, you know, oh, the Roman Catholics are the ones who talk about living saints. And we, if you're a Protestant, you still believe that we stand in communion with the church triumphant. We are the church militant. The church triumphant are those who have received their reward and they're in heaven. And these, the church, triumph, the church militant is us who are on this earth battling for the faith. The Nicene Creed represents the height of orthodoxy in the early period, fighting for the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's why we honor it. Is it of equal authority with Scripture? No. Does it represent the teaching of Scripture? Yes. 
Does it deal with heresy? Yes. And my question is, how do you think that we should deal with modern day heresy? Because you got to understand, heretics and false teachers know their Bibles and they know them well. I mean, I don't know if you've ever encountered someone who's just completely off their rocker doctrinally, and you can tell, and you're talking to this guy, you're like, this guy, but he knows the Bible like the back of his hand. He can quote verse after verse and scripture after scripture. The Arians were like this. By the way, Arius was a hymn writer, apparently a very good one. Apparently, much of Arius' teaching was set to music, and it was really good music. And it was really good lyrics. So heretics can have this. But what, what? But here's the thing. You have to find the formulation that shuts the heretic down. So you could be sitting there with an Arian back in the day, and they're going on about this and about that and quoting scripture after scripture to you. They quote 15 different scriptures. They quote all there. And then you say, well, yeah, I hear what you're saying, man, but Jesus is homoousios with the Father. Well, that's just crazy. Wow. What? What? You can't believe. That's crazy. No, we... That's what, I, that's what I confess, that he's homoousios with the Father. And then let's look at some scriptures that teach that, of course. But as you can see, the word used an extra biblical word in order to reinforce a biblical truth. Do you see that? This is important because in our modern time in the evangelical church, it's like, well, no, we, we can't do that. We, we just quote the Bible. Well, if that's what the fathers did, then there would be no distinction between Orthodox Trinitarian theology and Arianism because they chose this extra biblical word, although their instinct was to not do that, as we read in the quote, their instinct was to only use biblical terminology, but they used the extra biblical word in order to combat the heretics in order to combat the heretics. So we will continue this study in the Trinity. Um, I, I highly recommend that you um, do all the study you can on this. I mean, this is, this is one that's really lacking um, in our studies. Um, what is the Trinity? What is the doctrine of the Trinity? What's the biblical teaching of it? And I hope these first two lessons have at least given you a start. This is admittedly an overview. This is admittedly just, just giving you a, a, a dipping your toe in the water of these matters. But study to show yourself approved. Study scripture. Study church history. Study historical theology. And um, just keep listening to this podcast if you're getting, getting um, content and getting value out of it. So thanks for joining us for this edition of Apologetics from the Attic. God bless.